I, John, in Tim Fojo. Swear by Almighty God. Swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. Touching the matter in issue. Touching the matter in issue. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Honorable John and Tim Fojo, member for Asing South, is that right? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I was confused the South and the North because uh, coming from the choir, I come upon the North before the South, so I always assume the South first. <laughs> You're second term member of this parliament. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. And you're a member of this committee. That's also correct. This is the first time you're taking a position in public office apart from being a member of parliament. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. All right, so tell us a little more about yourself. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I'm joining Tim Fojo, a member of parliament for us in South Constituency, a mineral engineer with expertise in economic policy management and also foreign policy. I have worked in the mining industry to the level of a superintendent and thereafter proceeded to pursue entrepreneurship and then from there pursued a political career to serve the good people of Asin South. I have joined a couple of committees in the seventh parliament, namely the Foreign Affairs Committee. I was also the vice chair to the committee on members holding offices of profit. And in this current parliament, I'm a member of the appointment committee and member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. I also chair the Ghana Canada Parliamentary Friendship Association and the Reverend Minister. Thank you. Very well. Yes. Uh, Chairman, uh, thank you very much as I join you in congratulating uh, our colleague. Now, just uh, for purpose of our record, John and Tim Fojo, you spell your Fojo with an O after the J. The President's Office of 21st April 2021 spells the Fojo with J, not with you after the J. You want to give us a correct one? Thank Should you, Honorable Chair. That observation is correct. The Whose is correct? Yours or the presidency? The, name, the spelling of my CV is what is correct. It's just an interchange of the O and the U. And so I would crave the indulgence of the committee to accept what is on my CV. All right. That's appreciated. Still on your CV. Doctor of Philosophy in Political Science. Are you done? I'm on my thesis. How long have you been on this? This is my fifth year. So it's not like you'll be a student, student uh, minister, deputy minister. Is that the case? Honorable Chair, I'm just about concluding my thesis. And so it is suspected that all other things being equal, that within the shortest possible time, I should be able to. I know sometimes it takes long, but uh, six years on, we still find that in your CV. Now, that leads me to the next page of your CV, Chair. Uh, Member of Parliament, January 20, just watch to, your, to the right. January 2017 to date, July 2011 to, 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 to date. Now, the January, were you a member of the Appointments Committee as of 5th January 2021? Thank you, Chair on to where you have leadership experience. Thank you, Honorable Chair. My membership of the eighth parliament ties in with the tenure constitutionally mandated. All right, thank you. Is it our Professor Kwame Bafuata of uh, Chairman's or Commonwealth Hall? Is that the, is that the 
Professor Boafu, is he at the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission? That's correct. You cite him for purposes of your reference. The government praises and hails itself free senior high school. Investment in human capital and investment in literacy and numeracy. Where is Ghana on that? What's your appreciation of the progress or challenges we have made at a country in pursuit of that noble objective? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chair. The government over the past five years has made very significant investment into education and recognizes that when the population is highly educated and possess the requisite skill, it is, will be on a path to economic transformation. And therefore, the requisite investment ought to be put into education. We have seen that policy progressing. I am always very enthused when the investment into free SHS is mentioned because I recall some decades back my plight in the village Asin Krua at the time no electricity no telecommunication access completing and struggling through SHS. I wasn't the only brilliant student from my village but I was the only person who could make it through to SHS and today many of my colleagues may not be on this seat to meaningfully and, and significantly contribute to nation building. Today, the narrative is not so, so because many students from all over the country would have access to second cycle education. You share the view that quality have been compromised for quantity? Honorable Chair, I do not agree to that assertion. Why? Considering all the reports available, the performance, annual performance report of the education sector, also the WIAC reports that we have seen and comparative studies that are available indicates that education outcomes are improving for the past five years steadily are improving. Quality is not compromised. Recently, when the 2020 WIAC report was announced out of 465 students in West Africa who scored A1 in all eight subjects, 88% of them 411 to be precise, were Ghana Free SHS graduates. For the first time, over 50% of our students from Ghana who sat the WASI passed all core subjects. And all the figures are there for the various years to compare. And it's, it's a very huge gain for the country. It is a narrative that a country must be so proud of. And for which I do not think that quality has been compromised. All right, thank you very much. Back to your CV again. I believe uh, page two, Member of Parliament, January 7, 2017 to January 7, 2021. Is it January 7? Just for guidance. Seventh. And you have chosen, yes, to January 7, 2021. You said so in it's your It's January 7th, please. Ah, okay, chair. so indulge chairman and then do what is appropriate. Very now, much so. You have chosen to define key responsibilities of parliament. You see, you are under oath, so you have given this CV under oath. Representation of constituents in parliament and lawmaking. Is that all you do as MP in your CV? Is that all you do as member of parliament? Thank you, chair. Thank you, honorable chair. For the purposes of brevity, I kept it so. Technical and vocational education, in my view, enhances employability. You would be assisting the Minister for Education in reaching out to the training of our young people. What is your take on elevating technical and vocational education? Thank you, Chair. Technical and vocational education form very critical part in the economic transformation of every nation. It is upon this backdrop that His Excellency Nanando Danko Kufuado has strategically envisioned that by the, by the end of 2030, even the science to humanity ratio will have to be improved and transformed from the current 35 to 65 to 60 science, technology, engineering, and then 40 humanities. And so we, we have on record many investments that have been put into TVET transformation. The recent bill that was passed, the Pre-Tertiary Education Act, also goes to give credence to the priority being set to transform that sector.
Thank you, Chairman. Name any free senior high school in your constituency and share with us what their challenges have been. Thank you, Honorable Chair. The free SHS, the high schools in my constituency are seen Mansour Secondary School where I attended, Yankumasi and Hinkro Secondary School, Adankoman Secondary School and Insuta Secondary School are all running very well. As and when a challenge comes to my attention, we'll promptly respond. You are not aware of any challenges. They have not brought anything to your knowledge, to the best of your knowledge. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I'm in constant engagement with all the stakeholders running these uh, um, secondary schools in my constituency. And as and when any su such challenge comes to my attention, I would promptly respond. Do they have challenges? None that has come to my attention. Thank you. As the free core subjects textbooks are given. Are you aware what the status of elective subjects textbooks are? Thank you, Honorable Chair. At the same time when the four core subjects textbooks were supplied, elective subjects, elective textbooks were also supplied. Uh, core they subjects were given to free? students. Core subjects were given to students and elective textbooks kept in the library for reference. So do students enjoy free elective textbooks. Precisely so, on our chair. Elective textbooks are given for free to students of the free senior high school program. That is so, and as I indicated, the core subjects are given to the student for their keeps for the period that they are in the, that particular level, whereas the electives are kept in the libraries for their reference. Why are the time. electives not given to the students, and what will you do about it if you get approved to the ministry. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I shall interrogate why that is so, and at the appropriate time when approved, give a response. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Reverend for your congratulations once more. Thank you. My very, very first question has to do with abandoned school projects um, and what your take will be on that and what you will do to assist your minister to complete those school projects. When you come to uh, my constituency, uh, for example, uh, post-COVID arrangements uh, are such that the total numbers in the classrooms are supposed to be managed and controlled but we have a number of school projects uh, which um, are halfway through but have not been completed. Some have been there for more than 10 years, uh, and yet we are struggling for space for these children to uh, study in a very good atmosphere. What would you do uh, to remedy this situation? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Government, you agree, is a continuum, and so it is important that every project that is begun by one government is continued. It is for this reason that President Donato Danko Kufado has time and time again emphasized his commitment to complete every project started in any regime that is still at various stages of completion, in addition to new projects that he's undertaking and investing into. There's a comprehensive report here from FPMU detailing the statuses of every project and the status at the appropriate time. We may have the time to share the details, uh, but the commitment I'm giving you is that all my briefing indicates that all the projects that were started that at various stages of completion are being, com are, are being pursued and investment put into it. As a matter of fact, some are completed. Um, just singling out e-blocks, for instance, 129, at the time of 2016 were completed, this precedent has pursued and continued. And indeed, as we speak, 39 of them have been completed. The rest at various stages of completion. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Um, again, what is the policy direction of your government to end the menace of schools under tree? I am asking this question uh, on the background of a news item published by Ghana Web on the 1st of June, 2020, 
where Ofosu Bato MA Basic School pupils study under trees. I know that this is not limited to Ofosu Bato MA Basic School. Um, we understand that with all the gains government uh, would be making with free SHS, we would need the foundation to be strong in order to build uh, on that foundation with the free SHS. What is government direction as far as removing schools under trees at the basic level concerned? Oh, thank you. Policy directions are the, uh, certainly not within the domain of a deputy minister, but from my briefing obtained and my interactions with the Honourable Minister, what I have gathered is his commitment to ensure that schools under trees receive interventions and, and they are eliminated. I'm aware of a VACO Trust intervention to commit to eliminating schools under trees. I'm aware of Bagdia funding that is also committed to that. But even beyond that, my minister is always interrogating, the Honorable Dr. Yaose Duchum is interrogating how we came to this point, where the, why should there be schools under trees? A lot of studies have gone in, some review that there are some needs in certain communities, but because the planning of the educational needs are not coordinated and integrated, as community and stakeholders, well-intentioned, may begin a school, and teachers may be sent there, and then infrastructure will have to follow. So now he's going to take a pragmatic approach whereby the education infrastructure planning will be done. And so schools will have to be built where the need is established and the school, the, the, the building commissioned and operationalized even before the school starting. So whilst funding is targeting it, this direction would also help solve it going forward. Now my very last question borders on the free SHS. Um, recently, when we were on recess and we were touring the, uh, my, I was touring my constituency, I came by young men who were in this JAMA group doing a JAMA and by themselves. Free education, no classroom. Free education, no classroom. Oh, in Medina. Oh, this happened at, we had at uh, Danfa in Medina. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, um, uh, well, that's just by the way. Now, my, my question is that on hindsight, because Deputy Minister, no, Deputy Minister is a policy making position. Um, oh, yes, definitely, you are part of policy making. Um, before a policy is introduced, there are three key things that we should be looking for. Funding, personnel, infrastructure. Do you think that on hindsight, this policy could have been implemented differently as it done, is being implemented now? Thank you, Honorable Chair. I must state the commitment of this government the past few years in investing heavily into infrastructure expansion at the SHS level. Per the reports available to me indicates that out of 1,135 projects that were initiated between 2017 and 2020, 508, 584 of them have been completed and been used at the various SHS level. That is significantly expanding access. Now, the issue of the uh, the issue of access is very crucial. Between 2014 and 2016, the enrollment at the um, SHS level was about 800,000 people. Now, the narrative for the same period, 2017, 2020, is 1.2 million, meaning 400,000 people without the implementation of free SHS would have truncated the education at the GHS level, just as I used my experience as an example at the outset of my submission Many of these 400,000 people, for, if you look, consider the reports from 2013, 2014, 2015, there were averagely 100,000 children who were not able to proceed, transition from DHS to SHS. The problem was access. There were a lot of barriers. This policy is justified. It is a very, in, a very important intervention, a game changer. It is not to any particular 
political parties credit. It is a real need that has been sought for the country, for which I believe that all stakeholders and all political parties will continue on that consensus for its sustenance. Yes, Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, congratulations, Reverend. Thank you. I'll take you to the Constitution under, I think, Chapter 6, under Directive Principles of State Policy, and um, shoot straight to the educational objectives, cultural and religious objectives of the country. Recently, we've had issues with some schools and um, some religious issues, some with regards to the wearing of hijab, some with the uh, wearing of Rasta head or whatever, Rastafarian issues, um, boards of schools, and a whole lot of challenges that I think has to be resolved well for us to continue to enjoy the uh, cohesion within society and re amongst religious bodies and the institutions. What is your take on this? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Just as the respected member of parliament and member of this committee has made allusion to the Article 35 states, the, the directive principle of state policy, um, specifically relating to that, Article 35.5 enjoins the country to be integrated and promotes non-discrimination on the basis of creed, faith, and any such biases or backgrounds. It, the Constitution enjoins us to live together. Uh, my faith in, in the book of Psalm 133 states that how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And so... In, in, in philosophically and, and jurisprudence, my understanding of the Constitution is not so much of Ghana as a secular state, but as a plural one, where multiplicity of faith exists, and we are one people expected to live together in that beauty. Um, considering the matters and the recent emergence and trends that the Honorable Member has made allusion to, in response to saying the Honorable Minister for Education, Honorable Yao, or say Educum has made very good strides engaging all stakeholders in education sphere, the religious stakeholders, mission schools, the Christian Council, the Muslim Council, the Islamic Council, the Muslim Caucus, and every religious organization that runs mission school if, if, to reach a certain consensus for a very broad guidelines and policy on some of these things to be addressed. And I have had the opportunity to observe some of these interactions. It is going creditably, and we would want to pursue that part. And one given the nod, I will support the minister to assure that a comprehensive policy is reached to address these concerns. Thank you. Um, thank you, Reverend. Um, school sports, school sporting activities um, amongst our schools produce the best sporting talent the country has ever had. That is nothing to write home about. And I think it's an area that your ministry must look at. Um, how do you intend assisting your minister to promote this um, activity? Thank you, Honorable Chair. This is a very tenable observation, which I very much believe, knowing the Honorable Dr. Yawase Edukum, we would welcome that call to take a look at that and give the necessary support to improve that particular sector. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Gaga. Honorable <coughs> Fojo, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I... I'm sure by now you have been briefed about um, the decision of the education ministry to engage the National Food Buffer Stock Company to, as it were, supply 
food to the various senior high schools across the length and breadth of our country following the implementation of the free senior high school policy. If you are, I'd just like to um, draw your attention to the modus operandi of the National Food Buffer Stock Company relative to food supply to the various schools. Now, what they do essentially is to contract contractors or suppliers who then in the name of the buffer stock company supply the schools with the food staffs. Now, this is done without recourse to one, the procurement plans of the various schools including their entity tender committees, which is actually provided for in law. Now, if you're given the nod, Honorable Fojo, how would you deal with this situation? Thank you, Honorable Chair. My minister has engaged recently suppliers supplying to SHS through National Food Buffer Stock to receive the assurances, to understand their challenges, and to ensure that there is continual supply of food and food is made available to our, our daughters and sons in the SHS to be able to have the sound mind to study. As to the modalities of the procurement is an issue that can be discussed, and any such discussion is welcome. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, there is also this issue, and uh, oh, Abba, it's not a difficult question. It's a question. <laughs> this, this, this. Sorry, Honourable Fojo. Uh, I'm sure you are also very familiar with the uh, Professor Avoke, former VC of Winneba University, University of Education, Winneba. Now, <laughs> Professor Avoke was removed from office on an allegation of malfeasance. He was subsequently vindicated. No, the appeals, I'm not interested in that, by the court. And yet, he remains, or he, he, he hasn't been reinstated, notwithstanding the fact that the earlier litigation was in his favor. What is your opinion, I mean, regarding this situation? I mean, within the context of social justice. Thank you, Honorable Chair. You, you were involved. The Honorable Member is a lawyer and would agree that given the complexity of his question and need to be well briefed and, and vested with the facts, the pronoun judicial pronouncement, and, and how this whole matter has, has, has transpired to date. Upon that, I will be able to give an informed response. Thank you. Very well. Um, an earlier question was asked about um, abandoned school projects. And uh, you gave an assurance that uh, the president has given indication that all abandoned projects would be completed. But, Honorable Fodjo, if you're giving the law to serve as Deputy Minister for Education, I, 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 I would want you to have at the back of your mind the fact that some of the projects which were initiated by the GET Fund have stalled for well over four years. Four years. We have six classroom blocks that were uh, started under the GET Fund project, and I can mention a lot in my constituency if you go to a suburb of Uyaga called Palenza. There's a school there, six classroom. There is another one at Kadema, six classroom. After 2016, the contractors have never returned to site, honorable. So beyond the rhetoric, yes, we would, we would, we would, we would fix all abandoned projects. Wh wh what would you do to ensure that these abandoned projects see the day of light? I mean, to help deal with the um, uh, 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 problems we have had with uh, schools operating under trees. 
Thank you, Honorable Chair. I think I've uh, earlier on addressed the matter to do with schools and the trees, and in specific response to the, on, the respected Honorable Members' inquiry, Palenza and Gadema schools will receive, I can assure when I'm giving the nod, will receive immediate attention to interrogate what, why, what has accounted for that and the nursery remedial action given. Thank you. Honorable, I take you for your word and I'll follow up when you are approved. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm done. Yes, I Thank you very much, um, Honorable Team. I believe I was in your situation many years ago, sitting where you were sitting as a Deputy Minister nominee. Um, at the beginning of this year, I raised the issue of the financing of tertiary education um, in the context of COVID alleviation. But if you look at Article 25 of our Constitution, it says clearly that higher education shall be made equally accessible to all on the basis of capacity by every appropriate means, and in particular, by progressive introduction of free education. So our constitution envisages that at a certain point, tertiary education should be free. Um, do you foresee during your tenure that you will be able to do anything to reduce the cost of tertiary education in our country? Thank you, Honorable Chair. That commitment will certainly be beyond the remit of my mandate. Uh, I wish I could have given that <laughs> assurance, but that is certainly not within the remit of my mandate. But what I do recall is when a similar question was posed to the Honorable Dr. Yao Ose Educhum, um, the concern, he acknowledged the concern, the need, and, and assured that he would engage with the um, SLT uh, Student Loan Trust Fund to fashion out how some expansion can be explored to, to mitigate the plight at the tertiary level. So that much can be pursued, and that much I can tell. Thank you. The student unions have made a strong case that COVID, in spite of all the problems that it brought on us, also exposed um, us to the setup where tertiary education can largely be delivered online, and many of them tend to receive tertiary education online. And the person-to-person -person contact has been reduced. And therefore, in their opinion, cost has also been reduced in terms of the deliverer, that is the university. But then it has been increased in terms of data students having to buy bandwidth and et cetera to receive the delivery. But then also, it has been reduced to them in terms of accommodation. They don't need to go to school to live there to receive tertiary education. In the light of this development, don't you think that we should be engaging the tertiary universities, especially the public ones, to get them to reduce their fees? Thank you, Honorable Chair. COVID-19 has occasioned the world over the need to look into innovative ways of administering learning and so um, a lot of ICT interventions will have to be explored and as a, at the moment I can I can speak to the interventions that the Honorable Dr. Yaose Duchum is championing where send loss is being retooled and empowered to be able to address these emerging challenges to ensure that ICT is deployed adequately particularly at the tertiary level uh, to ensure that even the president's target of expanding or increasing gross tertiary enrollment ratio from the current 18.8 .8 to 40% by 2030 is, is done. So there are a lot of engagements that are already ongoing, but specifically to, to calling for tertiary institutions to reduce their fees, I do not think there's, there's sufficient facts and information available for me to make a decision on that. Thank you. You have taken time to look at the facts and the information and um, 
you, do, you don't think that there's a need to reduce the cost of, I mean, the fees that students pay in tertiary institutions. Is that, is that what you're saying? Well, thank you, Honorable Chair. I, I believe my good friend and respected colleague very much acknowledges his even personal principles of taking decisions that are data-backed sufficiently. And at the moment in my seat, I'm not vested with that information to be able to take a decision on this request. Thank you. All public universities are required to present annual reports um, to the minister, which must be forwarded to parliament. If you look at the act establishing the tertiary universities, have you looked at those annual reports, especially the income and expenditure, uh, how much money comes to the universities, to have a sense of whether or not there could be a basis for action for reduction of fees from students? Thank you, Honorable Chair. I still maintain my, my earlier submission. Which of them? That you've not looked at the reports? Or? That I am not sufficiently vested with the relevant data to be able to make a decision on your inquiry. And so the point I'm making is that that data is supposed to be in the annual reports of the universities. Have you looked at those reports? I haven't. Okay, will you ensure that those reports come um, routinely and as required by law to this parliament so that we can have a closer look at what is happening in the tertiary universities, tertiary institutions, the public tertiary institutions? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Those documents, as per the constitutional procedures, will, will do go through, and the parliament, as an institution, would have them as and when the, the procedures are applied. And so that should not be a challenge. Parliament assessing it or any stakeholder assessing it, these are matters of public record. And so uh, some decision can be taken when the engagement is done and the figures looked at, the report sufficiently analyzed, then we can know the way forward on that. Chairman, I believe I've exhausted my... Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you very much, Chairman. Good afternoon and congratulations, Honorable Reverend Fojo. Thank you. Uh, my first question takes us back to some earlier questions that were posed. And um, I want to share with you some data regarding schools under trees. Presently in Ghana, we have 2,417 schools operating under trees. Of this number, 1,167 are primary schools, 989 are junior high schools, and 261 are kindergartens. When we fast forward to the senior high school, the issue of whether we are running a double track, triple track, gold track, what are the other tracks? Platinum, silver, all has to do with the issue of infrastructure. At the end of the day, it's the lack of infrastructure that is making us introduce and implement these tracks that some of us still are grappling to understand. What does it tell us as a nation that the issue of infrastructure in the educational sector remains a Herculean tax, that government has to begin to take pragmatic steps to resolve the issues of infrastructure. The Honorable Agalga alluded to some abandoned school projects that were started by the previous government of this country, the NDC government, I have one sitting in the Salaga North constituency. I share borders with them. At Kualbi, since the elections of 2016, no contractor has returned to that site. And yet we are grappling with infrastructure. What would you do together with your sector minister to ensure that at least this issue of infrastructure is eliminated once and for all? that students can go to school at whatever level in this country 
and steady in comfort as a human rights issue. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Honorable Chair. It's interesting the, the, the interest of the honorable, uh, respected honorable member in adding more minerals to the tracks already existing, platinum, silver. These are not tracks <laughs> existing in the, in the, but on, on a more serious note, to the tenable concerns raised, it is for the purposes of expanding infrastructure across the various levels of education, which 2007 infrastructure were commenced between 2017 and, 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 and now, and 933 of them have been completed. The rest under various stages of completion. I have earlier given a submission to the effects of, the, of President Okufado's commitment to ensure that every infrastructure that is begun, regardless the regime or respective of the regime that started it, is continued. Uh, a comprehensive debate about um, projects at various stages of completion as to who started it will, will, re will bring about many revelations because there are many projects that were started by various regimes and are still at various stages of completion, many of which have received intervention and completed and others also. So the debate is going forward. Now, if free SHS had not come on the challenge of infrastructure, one of the barriers, the 400,000 children would have been home, truncated. So the school of thought that until we have sufficient infrastructure, 400,000 of a productive population should be sacrificed on the basis that there is not adequate infrastructure now, then it triggers some form of form alternatives. Okay, so if the, num the, uh, the number of infrastructure available, the cap total capacity available, if we have to use same to serve 1.2 million students, what will be the tenable way out? What are the best practices out there that have been deployed? even in, in targeting such challenges as and when they arose in other jurisdictions. And then we learn from them. And then double track, as complex that when it's explained, it seems, is, is, is something that is very important and is something that cannot be done away with at this point in time, unless a decision is taken on consensus at the national level that 400 to 500,000 students will have to be sacrificed on the altar of infrastructure constraints. And the question will be whose child will have to be dropped out? Whose child is to continue? So we must appreciate the investment put in so far. Considering the steady investment year on year into infrastructure, the target that President Kufado set at the outset of free SHS that between five to seven years, double track system will be eliminated is on course. And if we are to go this way, that will be eliminated. Just yesterday, my minister, the Honorable Dr. Yaose Edichum, gave a firm assurance to the media that between two to three years, that tracking system will be eliminated. But at the moment, it is serving a good purpose. And that is what we must acknowledge. On the issue of schools under trees, I have given the submission again, and I will still be, I will still be humble enough to reiterate that VACO Trust Fund, Badia, and some other funding interventions have been committed to address that. And my, my minister- I don't remember. It's, I think a simple question is being avoided. There are schools, projects that were started that have halted. She wants your assurance that they will be um, worked on. Is that all? Is that not right? Thank you, Honorable Chair. And that assurance will be given again that any project that is at any stage of completion, irrespective of which regime started it, is receiving attention and will be pursued to completion. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Honorable nominee, when you look at the Constitution again, Article 34, the directive principle of state policy contained in this chapter shall guide all citizens, emphasis man, all citizens. the cabinet, political parties, and other bodies and persons in applying or interpreting this constitution or any other law and in taking and implementing any policy decisions for the establishment of a just and free 
society. 35 clause 5 of the same constitution says, the state shall actively promote the integration of the peoples of Ghana and prohibit discrimination and prejudice on the grounds of place of origin, circumstances of birth, ethnic origin, gender or religion, creed or other beliefs. In the recent past, we've had issues about religion dominating the discussion in this country. Schools have taken certain actions based on certain people, students' religious beliefs. Indeed, we had a revered man of God in this country make some statements to the effect that because one religion is in the majority, their way of worship should supersede everyone else's interest and in worship and other religious rights in this country. On the heel of that came the Achimota School Rastafarian issue. As a reverend father yourself, what will be your personal opinion on the ruling of the Achimota School saga and the president of the Methodist Church who made those statements about religion and how, because one religion is more than the other, things should be done in a certain way in this country without reference to this constitution that is supposed to guide how we all live and operate within the sovereign entity of Ghana. The last thing I want to add is, how did we get here? Most of us went to mixed schools, we went to schools, we had different religions, but we managed to hold the sanctity of this country. Why are we talking about Ghana and religion at this time? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, I, I would relish the opportunity to uh, re-emphasize some of the submissions I've earlier given, that I am a Reverend Minister, a proud Christian, and my faith tells me in the book of Psalm 133 that how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, and even likens, to, likens it to the oil that flows on the head of the priest Aaron to the, to the garment. Now, I would want to say in perspective that Ghana is a nation for all, every citizen that lives in, and with regards to multiplicity of faith and recognition of same, we have lived together and continue to coexist in mutual respect. And I think that every, everyone has played their role to contribute to this cohesion. And so I would, I would humbly appeal that every stakeholder exercise restraint to ensure that the considerable contributions that everyone has made is not undermined and that our cohesion as a nation is fostered ahead. Regarding my comment to do with um, the judicial pronouncement, I would refer that opinion to Article um, 12 of the Constitution and with the indulgence of the chairman, uh, refer that the fundamental human rights and freedoms enshrined in this chapter shall be respected and upheld by the executive, the legislature, and judiciary, and all, and all other organs of government and its agencies, and where applicable to them, by all natural and legal persons in Ghana, and shall be enforceable by the court as provided for in this constitution. So my comment is a judicial pronouncement has been made on a matter, and the stakeholders involved are respecting the decision of the court, and as we speak, the two gentlemen are in school. Thank you. German, just Psalm 133, you didn't say verse 1, you didn't say verse 2, you are reverend, you just said Psalm 133, where are we? We are following you closely. Just go to the first verse. Uh, only verse, okay, 1331, thank you, Chama. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My final question is, Mr. Nomni, Student Loan Trust Fund, 
What are the modalities for applying for the loan? Why are we having this situation where students are admitted into tertiary institutions and they are struggling to pay the first year fees before they get enrolled on the student loan trust fund? What can we do to ease this burden on students so that once they get their admissions into tertiary institutions, they must be able to use that admission letter to start processing their loans before school begins so that the difficulties and inconvenience of struggling to find money to pay the fees will be eliminated. What will you do to, to make sure that we have this seamless process for prospective students? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. That's a tenable concern, and the uh, Honorable Member can be assured that her suggestions are cherished. And in, in confirmation of my Honorable Minister, the Honorable Dr. Yaose Duchum's commitment when he appeared before the committee that he would engage with Student Loan Trust Fund to streamline some of these processes to ensure that the concern the Honorable Member has raised are uh, adequately and timelessly addressed. Thank you. Very well, thank you. Yes, Nilante. Honorable right, Chairman, uh, permit me to ask my very good friend and brother just a question. Uh, my allegiance to Asin South and Asin itself uh, was preventing me from asking him a question, but I want to. He's made a lot of comments, especially about abandoned projects and all those things. Uh, Chairman, you also made a comment on it. What I would say here is the fact that uh, I believe sincerely if we have projects that are not completed, why do we start new ones? That is a very difficult thing for me. I, people are talking about Bekwai and Salaga and places. Here, right here in Accra, in the capital, Ododododio, we have four abandoned school projects. So that is a difficulty. But my question is, if I should ask you objectively to, th to tell me one thing working with the free SHS and one thing not working with the free SHS, what will you say? Thank you, Honorable Chair. I, I take it that the Honorable Members declared <laughs> interest in Asin South. And I must thank him that it was during his time as National Service, through his intervention, my village, Asin Krua, had the first pie bone water. And so that, uh, that assertion must be appreciated. On abandoned projects, I would continue to, uh, to assure that consistent with President de Kufuado's commitment, every project begun by various regimes at various stages of completion will be pursued to completion. And in response to free SHS, free SHS is a very prudent and uh, transformational policy, which all stakeholders are supporting and, and, and and rightly so, because of the gains that will yield for the whole country. My background as economic policy analyst, every policy that is planned and, and implemented in any part of the world has in itself, you know, monitoring evaluation and reviews, formative reviews, such that the objectives will have to be kept on track and parameters that are deviating are also kept in track. And, and all those cycle is playing out just in free SHS. So we'll continue monitoring and any feedback that comes up that needs quick attention will be looked at and addressed. Thank you. Uh, Rev, my good brother, I, my question really is to your, let me say your own appraiser, what is one thing that is working well with the policy, and one thing that is not working well with the policy, looking at it from your own policy point of view. The key policy objectives have been access, quality, equity, and relevance. And all these indicators available are pointing creditably to the fact that access has been increased. In, and, and all these four pillars are aligned to the attainment of SDG 4. Access to quality education for all. And on all these counts, 
quality education has not been compromised. And so access has been increased from 800,000 enrollment to 1.2 million. As we speak, cumulatively 1.6 million. Equity, it's the, the, there was a portion in the policy that made 30% allocation to elite schools for students or peoples from public schools. That has ensured that a child from a village like mine would be able to have access to a, a school like Abri Girls. And recently, there's a story, a very inspiring story of a young lady who swept six out of the seven awards of Abri Girls. And this was someone who benefited from this 30% equity um, policy. On, in terms of relevance, all the indicators are out there in terms of quality. All the indicators are pointing to the fact that one over 50% of our students who sat WASI are passing in all core subjects. And you know, so in brevity, the outcomes are speaking to the fact that the objectives are being achieved and that we must sustain it. Thank you. Yes, and I, would, I, I just want to continue. So uh, there's, not, there's nothing that is not working with the system. Because all the, I agree, access quality. What is one thing that you think is not working well? Uh, thank you. There's, thank you, Honorable Chair. There's been a number of discussions going on, and my minister has engaged stakeholders. One of the issues that came up, which is very important, had, had to do with improved communication. For instance, the development levy component of the fees that were hitherto paid by parents as have been absorbed by the government, have been paid and disbursed. But the stakeholders thought that because there was no narration specifically you know, relating to rates, they thought that they needed a strand levy, for which they were, I mean, that, that was pointed out. So going forward, every such release that will go, will go with the narration for them to know the actual allocation for development projects. So stakeholders will have that transparency. Again, a concern to do with prepaid meter system for SHS, which the heads of schools have had cause to complain, the minister has promptly responded and taken steps to ensure that they are all done on postpaid and the bill ferried to the ministry for prompt payment so that that burden of initially pre-financing is removed. So some of these are, I would call it feedback that is coming, that, that's receiving prompt attention. And these are things that continuously will be monitored. Thank you. Okay, Chairman, um, I will plead my, with my colleague to get the recent Joy News um, program that assessed the free SHS so that he will be appraised um, a lot before he takes up full uh, mantle of the office he's been given. It will, help, it will help him a lot with his system. My next question has to do, all of us are happy about the fact that Many of our children who otherwise wouldn't have had secondary education now by the system we will do. But what happens after free SHS? Have we thought about what happens after free SHS? Have we assessed the number of children who get stuck after free SHS? Have we looked at that one? Thank you, Honorable Chair. It is in pursuit of this policy objective that his Excellency President Akufuado has targeted that by 2030, the country should have gross tertiary enrollment ratio of 40% from the baseline of 18.8. .8. Currently, 18.8 .8 in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa will, would be one of the highest, but compared to best practices elsewhere, is still one of the lowest. And so we are pursuing rigorously expansion policies to open university for instance, as far advanced, MOU has been reached between um, Ghana Tertiary Education Commission and, and, and Ministry of Education on the one side and Open University UK to ensure that access is opened and many other interventions geared towards absorbing those that are coming from pre-tertiary. But not only that, to align pre-tertiary transition to the relevance of the industry, contemporary times, cognizant of our fourth industrial revolution, to ensure that we are getting the right caliber and skills 
of students from pre tertiary to be able to even align to the transformation of 35, 65% science to humanity ratio to 60% science, technology, and engineering, and 40, 40, um, 40 humanities. And that is where STEM in, in initiatives have been introduced, and that is where it's been going all the way down, pursuing it down to pre tertiary levels to ensure we'll get the children transitioning with the right caliber of skills to feed the tertiary and, and, and that challenge to be resolved. Jama, sorry, I'm just uh, getting there. Uh, no, I notice. Uh, so, uh, so Chamama is just, uh, this 60-40, this is the second time you are repeating it in terms of access, science, and others. How do you intend to walk the talk? Thank you, Honorable Chair. There are pathways that the Honorable Minister, Honorable Dr. Ose Edichum has initiated uh, for implementation. At the moment, 10 STEM schools, uh, SHS schools, which are specialized schools, at various stages of completion and within the next one year will be operationalized. And these are going to open access for, for replication of, for instance, what we have at Presec. But a lot more than that, we'll be focusing on robotics, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, mechatronics, and such other concepts that must be imbued in our students at the lower levels. This is what advanced countries, South Korea, Vietnam, Japan, Canada, USA are doing to transform the economy. So we are going to start right. We're going to catch them young. We're going to uh, develop pathways for them. For instance, the minister is considering even visual arts having a pathway towards engineering, such that when one completes um, SHS and has, has passed in, in visual arts, it will not only be limited to the traditional pathways available but with some interventions, we'll be able to be drafted into pursuing architecture, for instance. And I know my good friend, the Honorable Member for Utu Senya um, West, is, is very much enthused with such pathways coming, coming into force. So there's going to be a STEM academy, ensuring that we get our children to specialize, we get our children to be familiar. I, for one, studied nuclear cells, biology, by, by just one-dimensional drawing and just you know, seeing where the nucleus is, cells, and all these, if, if with the coming to being of STEM, you will see in 3D, you will see the real simulation, you see what you're studying, the reality of it in contemporary times, so that in the future, we have a population that is relevant for the work, the work the skill set that I evolved. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, congratulations to you. Thank um, you. Starting with your CV, um, Doctor of Philosophy, PhD in Political Science, Foreign Policy Specialization, University of Ghana, Legon, 2016 to date. You've already answered uh, questions in relation to that. Have you had any publication yet since you started? Have you done any publications? Not yet, I'm, I'm still on the thesis and at the concluding stage. So when that is done, then publications will begin to arise out of that. Well, I thought uh, students are encouraged to uh, do publications uh, along uh, the line. Anyway, but um, let's discuss the issue of enrollment in relation to um, free SHS. It seems to be the um, greatest achievement of free SHS when it is being discussed. But according to data from the UNESCO, um, enrollment has consistently increased in our secondary schools since 1971. And the latest figures, 2012, it was 56.44%, 2013, 67.76%, 2014, 64.06%, 2015, 67.91%, 2016, 68.90%, 2017, 69.01%, and 
and 2018, 71.32%. 2019, 74.68%. Indeed, the world average in 2019, based on 57 uh, countries, is set to be 79.52%. And these 57 countries are not countries that all provide free SHS. So my question is, since enrollment has consistently increased and as followed, as indicated by this data. What is the correlation between free SHS and the current increases that we are getting? What, has, what research has established that the consistent increase in line with what has always been the case is merely because of free SHS? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Just as I would need to have the figures and to validate um, in due course, I'm not disputing or accepting, but I'm just considering, I'm just stating that I would need to validate those figures. But there's one trend that was observed uh, from the Honorable Member's narration, and you could see con a, a very steady rise in enrollment. And so that is a trend. For the past five years, enrollment is rising very fast. Something must be accounting for this. Now, considering the fact that... No, it, it, it was always rising even before the last... But the rate years. of rise? No, it's, it's a factor. 56 to 67 to 67.91 to 68 to 69. I mean, 68 in 2016 and 69 in 2017. Just those marginal increases. And then 71 in 2018 and 74 consistent, nothing really dramatic. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I do not think we may have to um, debate on the trend. Uh, my analysis uh, give me the indication that these are certainly not incremental um, changes, but the Honorable Member has an opinion which I respect. But the point here is access has been increased. And, and, and the figures are there. The enrollment as of 2016, 800,000. Now 1.2, cumulatively as we speak, 1.6 million, partly because of expansion in infrastructure and the introduction of the double track system to ensure that the facility, same facility we have, enrolling 800,000 people can be utilized optimally to serve 1.2 million students. And costs, as a barrier, which I earlier raised, which many people from Zwarungu to Alubo to Bia relate with, that cost as a barrier was one of the major challenges, and that being removed, access was open. Well, um, like you said, maybe we will have to do a research that will establish the correlation uh, that exists between the current, uh, you know, increases, which is not too different from increase increment before the introduction of uh, free SHS, to establish how they are they are related. But um, I'll move on to uh, my next question. Same-sex marriage is an issue you are very passionate about. You have. Um, made a couple of statements on the floor, I think uh, recently, jointly with other colleagues on that subject. You have um, sought to organize even events to uh, discourage the country from uh, promoting uh, the practice and have even sought uh, to uh, legalize or legislate against an attempt to legalize same-sex marriage. You are going to the Ministry of Education. The ministry came under severe criticism when it attempted to introduce comprehensive sexuality education some time back. What will be your attitude, given that no clear policy direction as far as comprehensive sexuality education is concerned has come from the government of Ghana. We are yet to know if it is just shelved or just 
thrown out completely, never to be considered by the ministry or the government of Ghana. What will be your approach and your attitude towards um, the, uh, uh, if you like, shelved comprehensive sexuality education at the ministry? Thank you, Honorable Chair. My faith is resolute on, on some of these stands and in cognizance of the position of a constitution and in line with the norms of our people, I am always proud to advocate what is in line with the people that identify with these four backgrounds that I've outlined in respect of LGBTQI matters. Specifically to the session by the honorable member, I have I'm very keen on these studies, and I've done a lot of extensive studies between the year 2001 and 2009, and also 2017, and to date. And I can tell the Committee on Authority that never have I come across any attempt by the Ministry of Education within these periods I have mentioned to introduce comprehensive sexuality education. If there is any other period outside this, that the Honourable Member has evidence to that effect, I'll be glad to receive it and then a response would have, will, will be given. But like I said, from 2017 to date, from 2001 to 2009, I haven't come across any briefing anywhere, any uh, policy document, any, anything for that matter that is detailing any intent or proposition of the Ministry to introduce comprehensive sexuality education. Thank you. You haven't come across any such attempt? I haven't. Okay. Um, I'm sure the nation knows uh, what we discussed. Within the period, and I've put it in perspective. Yes, yes, what we discussed and where those materials came from. But I'll move on to my next issue. Um, this is in relation to some interesting happenings in your constituency before the elections of uh, 2020. Um, we all have one way or the other come under attacks and criticism as far as our adherence to COVID uh, protocols are concerned, especially around the uh, election time. Uh, even currently, uh, Occupy Ghana uh, just recently, I think yesterday, uh, had to issue a statement to uh, describe what happened at the late Sir John's funeral as reckless, uh, being supervised by the president. Uh, I have also seen videos of uh, what happened at the Accra Sports Stadium yesterday. Uh, so somehow we uh, want the laws applied. But in your constituency, around the same month of July, um, your opponent, was arrested by the police for organizing an event that was said to have gone against um, um, COVID protocols. Uh, the Central Regional Police Command uh, arrested Mr. Joseph Kofi Damche, and I have the uh, statement that was issued on 9th July 2020 and signed uh, Irene Sewaopong, Deputy Superintendent of Police Public uh, Affairs Unit. That was in July. And there's also a video online of you that same July, in that same constituency, uh, at events where people had gathered and you were sharing um, 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 what could best be described as campaign materials. Um, why did, does it appear to look like the law was applied differently to uh, both of you uh, engage in similar acts at the same time. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I have never appeared in any video where COVID-19 protocols were breached. And I know very well my good friend and respected colleague, Honorable Suhini, if there is any such available video, it could be made available. Because this is a very important platform, and so it is important that something that I have not done is attributed to me and I'm here, so I'm debunking. I have not breached at any point in time COVID-19 protocols. You have made references to specific breaches by some parties where you have evidence. You have had the same. I haven't breached any, and I'm not in any video purported to have breached 
COVID-19 protocols. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll submit the video later. I didn't expect a denial, so I didn't bring it, but I'll submit a video later. Thank you. Um, and maybe that's uh, my last question, but just to also note that um, the honorable nominee, you have to consider some publications, as I know, uh, publications are one of the milestones in, in, in these, uh, because uh, uh, this is a social science project, I mean, that he's engaged in, as far, in relation to his doctorate of philosophy. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just to state that the fact that publications have not been done that's, it's not an, um, an indication that not, no work has been done. It's extensive work in many spheres, I could share, but not none has been published yet, just to make that point clarified. Very well. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations. Thank you. Honorable. As of 2019, the gender parity index for gross enrollment in tertiary education in Ghana stood at 0 0.8, meaning that fewer women had access to tertiary education more than men. What are you going to do assisting your minister to ensure that we get many more women enrolled in our tertiary institution? Thank you. Thank you very much. Gender parity, Honorable uh, Chair, is one of the important um, indicators on, on, in the education strategic plan uh, per, being pursued by the Honorable Dr. Yawase Edichum in line with the President's vision. And so that concern is tenable and I will lend every relevant support to my minister in pursuit of same. My last question will be posting of teachers to rural areas. There's been a lot of work done on why teachers refuse posting to rural areas. What policy direction are you going to assist your minister to put in place to ensure that teachers are motivated to accept posting to rural areas? Because we know that people in the rural areas also need proper education. Thank you. I must, Honorable Chair, I must thank the Honorable Member for bringing this matter up. If not for the commitment and dedication of teachers who accepted posting to a Rua at a time when there was no access to electricity, no access to telecommunication, without access to ultra-modern education infrastructure, I would not be on this seat today. And so I support that any policy that will ensure that teachers are sent and receive posting to places where their services are needed the most, I would strongly support. Um, the minister, when he appeared before the committee, uh, made reference to the um, teacher posting rationalization policy, which has been pursued and some reforms that have been implemented in that sphere for which, um, as we speak, GES posts teachers directly from the headquarters to places where their services are needed most, not even decentralized to the district level. So if, when your appointment letter is given to you, they state on it the particular school location where you have to go, and I would support the pursuit of this policy to ensure that children living everywhere in Ghana receive that support. Thank you. That will be all, and I wish you the very best. Thank you very much. Very well, leader. German, thank you very much uh, once again. And to our colleague, the Reverend, you see, if you have a reduction in the cutoff point, as observed by the Honorable Suhin, from 36% to 52%, don't you accept that that naturally will account for increased enrollment? Well, thank you, Honorable Chair. And these are all tenable reforms that will promote accessibility. And that is the pursuit of the country. The country, by consensus, wants no child left behind. So any tenable reform that will ensure that quality is not compromised and access is given is something that I strongly support. Now maybe to practicalize my question, what aggregate 
goes to free senior high school. You have an idea? Which aggregate is taken to enter free senior high school? I know that with the exception of a fail in math and English, there's it's access it's to free wholesale. SHS. So the wholesale will give you increased enrollment because competition has suffered. And that is why we are saying that compromise probably have been compromised. Quality has been compromised. You see, if you get aggregate 18, 20, 22, in the age of competitiveness, there will be a cutoff. Now, you get 36, 48. So those children are likely, this is a real joke, the candidate will get 48 and go and tell the parent that he's done so well because he too has qualified for uh, free senior high school. What do you have to say to that? Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. The question Honorable Leader has raised um, touches on a very important challenge that needs to be addressed and that the Honorable Minister for Education has given indication of, of, of addressing. As we speak, there is no system even nationally standardized to assess the quality of education our children receive until the time they go to JHS3 and they write BEC. And then at that point, you know, they will have to get into SHS. Any intervention that was required even prior to entering into SHS would, would not have been given or identified if that was the terminal level. And so there's this national standardized test that the Honorable Minister is pursuing to ensure that from P2, P4, P6, there's a standardized test that is administered across all the schools in Ghana to assess the level of le learning poverty, the level of literacy, numeracy, and where interventions are required for instance, one is administered in P2 so that we have a broad level of um, competencies and skills of each student or people and their challenges. Interventions thank, are given at P3 you, thank you very much. and Chairman, we assess at P4. Uh, the nominee, you know, Professor Avin Adamens, a brilliant academic, and uh, he wrote an article on the state of education and shared his opinion on the state of quality free senior high school and the challenges associated with it. You will be assisting the Minister for Education. I know that you've been very loyal to the new minister, no reference even to the previous minister who undertook many of the activities in the last four years. Everything you say, the new minister, who is just as old as you, two, three months, uh, largely not the one who has anchored many of the things that have happened at that uh, particular ministry. But come to look at it. Now, every aggregate qualifies you to go to senior high school. Mathematically, isn't that accounting for increased enrollment instead of you just attributing it to the sole factor of the fact that it's free? Thank you, Honorable Chair. I welcome um, the findings of the Venerable Professor De Mensa, and I would relish to be able to take a comprehensive look at his findings and to take the needed steps and glean from his recommendations. And, and just to clarify, uh, the Honorable Dr. Matthew Poku Prempe undoubtedly gave an indelible contribution to our education pursuit. The references that I've made so far, uh, which had occasion the mentioning of the new minister is to do with the way forward what is to be done now and going forward but obviously whatever has been done between 2017 and 2020 are to the credit of the leadership of the ministry in this case honorable dr matthew poku prempe formidable education system established under his tenure uh, thank, thank you thank you alex chama he's come home now to appreciate that there was somebody uh, working at that minister. Chairman, my next question, I'd like to quote from Article 35.7 of, the, 35 of the 1992 Constitution, uh, which is a political sin with all uh, help to commit. And it reads, Chairman, as far as practicable, a government shall continue and execute projects and programs 
commenced by the previous government. I speak in respect of uh, what earlier colleagues have referred to. The Honorable Zuera attempted to look at it. Dormo in the Upper West region, uh, specifically in the Wild West constituency. I physically, in driving to an Nigerian village, had to stop by and take pictures of an uncompleted e-block. I heard you speaking to some of them. Uh, many of the e-blocks across the country are not completed. And what uh, Honorable Suhini sought to establish is the nexus between availability of adequate infrastructure and expansion in numbers. I have no fear of contradiction that this double track of red, gold, green is a function of the lack of absence of critical infrastructure. You want to give us an assurance that in assisting the minister, you will respect the letter and spirit of Article 35.7 of the 1992 Constitution. Honorable nominee. Thank you, Chair. Very much so, Honorable Chair. Uh, Chairman, I do not know which uh, I've seen some deputy ministers share with us what their portfolio emphasis will be. Since I do not know whether you will be for basic education or tertiary education or responsible for operations, there are questions about the quality of accredited tertiary institutions in Ghana. You just wake up, there's what you call mushrooming of private universities in Ghana that has no respect for quality standards, yet it has approval of the Ministry of Education working through its regulatory institutions, assure this committee that quality standards will not be compromised for purposes of higher education in the country using those institutions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, as the Honorable Leader has acknowledged, I'm yet to be approved, and so I'm yet to know my shadow. But in response to this important concern, if considering some of the key policy intentions of the Public University Act is all intention towards addressing some of these matters, and therefore I would support the re-engagement of stakeholders to ensure that the Public University Bill comes back to the table to ensure standards at the tertiary level are not compromised. Thank you. And Chairman, may I refer the nominee to Article 25.1 of the 1992 Constitution, which states, and I quote, all persons shall have the right to equal educational opportunities and facilities, and with a view to achieving the full realization, and Chairman, this is my emphasis, that right, basic education shall be well, free. Honorable Chair, I'll be glad to go along with the Honorable Leader. Honorable Article. Reverend, I'll go slowly. 25.1a is my emphasis. And this is my notion. You may be hearing it for the first time. It's my notion of the word progressive. When the Constitution says in 25.1, Basic education shall be free, compulsory, and available to all. So that level of education, I'm not too sure whether Ghana has achieved 100% free, compulsory, universal basic education. So you haven't gotten it right yet at that foundation level. And you are already, uh, my word, don't be offended, hastily implementing a free senior high school when you have not achieved compulsory basic education. What do you have to say to that? Thank you very much. In pursuit of the constitutional mandate, as the Honorable Leader has made reference to Article 25.1 and the subsequent sessions, and also aligned to the attainment of SDG 4, access to quality education for all, these interventions are necessary, particular free SHS. There is considerable gains made at the basic level and for which attention ought to be received also at the secondary level. If the concern for um, universal free, free universal basic education is tenable, which I strongly associate with, then it is equally tenable to look at the cycle sustained upwards. 
And so that Jama, so like I have said, my observation, maybe a national conversation on it, my notion of progressive would have been for the country to attain free compulsory universal basic education, then leap forward. But whilst we are still found wanting with schools under trees, lack of teaching and learning materials at the basic level, literacy and numeracy, not adequate training for the foundation level of students, we are at the epoch level of a, a free, a free uh, a, a senior high school. Probably for your reading again, uh, Professor Jiangma, uh, who used to work with the IEO, also has some uh, shared strong views on this uh, particular uh, matter. I know that you are interested in foreign policy, and on the floor of parliament, I've been reading some of your answers. UN resolution on the two-state resolution to Palestine, Israel. Where do you stand on it? Thank you, Honorable Chair. I stand on the resolution passed at the UN. Thank you. You shared a view of a two-state resolution to the crisis? I share the view as passed at the UN, which Ghana has subscribed to. Thank you. Will you be surprised if I quote your words when President Trump uh, uh, declared a certain position? Uh, what position you preferred on the floor of parliament? Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, uh, I believe strongly that the Honorable Leader very much acknowledges the many nuances and complexities embedded in this matter, the sensitivities therein, and this platform certainly will not be exhausted so because to address the them. Thank you. I'll move away and keep you to respect uh, resolutions of the UN at all times. I, I, I was perusing it, but uh, out of uh, respect for you, I don't need to paraphrase uh, what you said on the floor of Parliament. But I'm happy. Thank you, you Honourable. You, you gladly remember. Thank uh, you. You gladly remember when you made those uh, comments. So, Chairman. This nominee is to help the Honorable Minister for Education. And uh, have you complied with your tax obligations? Very much so, Honorable Chair. Have you declared your assets in accordance with the Constitution? In the process of doing so, Even Honorable in Chair. this new Parliament of 2021? Honorable Chair, please come again on that. Even for the eighth Parliament? In the process. <laughs> Chairman, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Honorable Reverend in Tim Fajor, we thank you for attending upon the house to answer questions. I have no more questions for you. You are discharged for now. Thank you, Honorable Chair.